Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. We're so glad you could attend. Come inside, come inside. There behind the glass stands a real blade of grass. Be careful as you pass. Move along, move along. Come inside, the show's about to start. Hi, and welcome to another episode in our continuing series on Metal Forming Live, covering a variety of topics of interest to metal forming companies. I'm Brad Coogan, Editorial Director of Metal Forming Magazine at the Precision Metal Forming Association, and along with David Klotz, our President, and Mike Boland, our Vice President. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to this one-of-a-kind one of event uh, made possible through the support of our generous sponsors. Today's broadcast focuses on the topic of uh, precision metal stamping. We're going to cover a variety of topics uh, related to that and uh, inspection techniques and what's going on on the shop floor uh, to ensure that metal stampers continue to deliver precision services to their customers. So uh, we'll get to it. I'm joined live here at PMA by Metal Forming Senior Editor Lou Kren and our distinguished panel of experts. Uh, and I, of course, want to say thank you to all of you online for joining us and attending today's webcast and invite you all to uh, please participate with us uh, using the Zoom interface. Uh, you can ask questions using that question panel uh, or the um, uh, con uh, comment panel on, on the Zoom screen. So it is intended to be very interactive and, and so please, please uh, join us and ask your questions. Uh, again, I wanna thank our sponsors whose generous, uh, generous supports uh, allows Metal Forming Magazine and PMA uh, to provide events uh, such as this one. Uh, our sponsors are uh, SAE, uh, Schuler, Universal Robots, ECI, On Robot, and Pacific Press. Uh, to get the ball rolling, uh, I'd like to invite you all to watch this brief sponsor video provided by SAE, and then we'll come back and we'll have our panelists introduce themselves. What SAE can offer you from a source perspective is a couple of things. One of them is get to know you. Who are you? What are your business needs? What are the upcoming challenges that you may face? And how SAE can provide you with a full turnkey project. It's a very large company, but with a small company feel to it. We have a lot of flexibility and capabilities for both our domestic side here at SAE America, as well as the support from our corporate overseas. We can really offer our customers a great value for our products to help them optimize their production, their ROI on, on the equipment they purchase. What I feel that makes C unique is the fact that we basically try to help the customer, we help think for them and try to benefit what their needs are or anticipate what they need so that we can better serve them. Shea has a very good product. We have the full complement of presses from 28 ton all the way up to 2,500 ton presses. And we have a full complement of parts in-house in Tennessee and also have service technicians really available to service all of our equipment. And typically whenever we receive a call for parts, we can get them out the same day. We have probably 95% of the parts here in Tennessee and Mexico. Shea has a very strong service department very strong service team. We're able to resolve the issue for the customers so that they can continue making parts and continue on with their production. From the point of finding a press project all the way after installation of the press project, we have excellent people at the factory. We have excellent people in the US. We have excellent people in Mexico that will help me help you become a satisfied customer. Perfect. Thanks again to Say and all of our sponsors for uh, supporting today's event. So now we'll go ahead and meet our distinguished panel of experts joining us today. Gentlemen, please go ahead and introduce yourselves. We'll start with uh, Stephen. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Stephen DePino. I am a, an engineering manager at Weissog. Uh, Weissog is a custom high-speed uh, metal manufacturer, stamping manufacturer, uh, specializing in the medical, automotive, and aerospace industries. And I particularly have been with Weissog for 12 years. Uh, and I deal with everything new tooling related uh, on the design side from uh, production all the way to prototyping. 
Hello, good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Ulens. I am the technical director here at Precision Metal Forming Association. I joined uh, PMA in 2015 after uh, nearly 40 years in the industry working in metal stamping and uh, tool and die. Hi, I'm Lou Kren, senior editor with Metal Forming Magazine and PMA. Now we'll go ahead and have our folks online introduce themselves. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi, I am Jeff Umler, the Director of Business Development at Walker Tool and Die. I've been with Walker for 33 years. Uh, we design, machine, and build uh, sheet metal stamping dies for the appliance and automotive industry. I'm also a member of the West Michigan District PMA Board. Great. Thanks for being here, Jeff. And Paul, last but not least. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Lightowler. I'm the APDIS Global Product Manager for Nicometrology. Uh, Nicometrology itself, we develop and produce uh, a range of uh, highly accurate metrology solutions from uh, laser based, from scanning through X ray to uh, video measurement systems and microscopy. Uh, I myself have over 20 years of experience within the automotive aerospace uh, industries with automation and metrology. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. So we've got one more sponsor video before we get started from Schuler. So we'll go ahead and play that video. What is it that you really want for the future? The latest technologies? Transparent machine data, higher production and process safety, straightforward support. The solutions in our digital suite enable your Schuler presses and external installations to be digitally retrofitted in a simple way. Transition does not always have to mean something new, so your installation can run even more efficiently and error-free in the future. We have developed the Control Retrofit, which includes, among other things, the Space Control Panel. The result, higher output, more safety, increased cost effectiveness, ready for industry 4.0, unplanned machine breakdowns and high downtime costs, thereby become a thing of the past. Would you like to have a tool that provides reliable machine and production data that can be accessed anywhere and at any time? Machine applications provide precise information for optimizing production and fast error analysis whether it be the production status or relevant temperature data. Our Edge device transfers data to the Schuler Cloud, where it can then be viewed in the MySchuler portal on your smart devices. Do you want optimal protection for your tool? Visual Dye Protection, our image-based tool monitoring system, recognizes foreign bodies and stops machines before expensive damages can even occur. The Upgrade VDP Analyzer enables you to analyze the error causes in detail afterwards. Do you need fast support? With Schuler Connect, we can assist you effectively and remotely during troubleshooting using smart glasses or a smartphone. Users simply connect with our experts and exchange installation data by image or video transfer in real time. Our hotline remote service will solve your problems anywhere in the world in no time, 24-7. Benefit from our digital solutions, whether it be our space control panel, machine applications, visual dye protection and analyzer, or Schuler Connect. And if it's additional services for more system safety and availability you want, you need look no further. Schuler service makes your wishes come true. Magazine's tooling by design column. So, Pete, uh, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Brad. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for that introduction and, and asking me to speak on precision stamping. Uh, when Brad asked me to put together a presentation, it led me to, to, to think about the definition of, of precision. So one of the first things that uh, came to mind 
one of the things that uh, came to mind uh, 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 for me was small, uh, high-speed type of, of, of parts and processes. Now, uh, obviously, those require a high degree of, of, of precision, at least in our perception. But also on this slide, you see an automotive steering columns assembly. Uh, now, this was a product I was directly involved with when I worked in manufacturing. And I could tell you firsthand, we were measuring uh, areas on this assembly within microns. So the, the measurements were uh, very small, even though that the, the product was rather larger than some of our high speed and more intricate uh, stampings. But the same can also be said for the automotive industry and automotive components. Now, automotive components are uh, much larger, but if you think in the uh, context of things, there's hundreds of stampings that go into a body and white structure that have to be welded together and to fit up properly so that when the entire vehicle is assembled and the outer body skins are put, put on, all the feature lines line up appropriately and uh, the, the gaps are, are what we want between the different panels and, and everything looks nice and nice and clean. Now you might say that my smaller high speed pipe stampings uh, have very tight tolerances compared to what might be uh, encountered in an automotive. So uh, that's true. So what we're talking about here is accuracy. So the accuracy of smaller components is uh, probably uh, more so than automotive components. And that's defined by the tolerances that are put on the parts. So let's talk about the differences between uh, precision and accuracy. Now, when we talk about accuracy, uh, accuracy and precision are both ways to describe how we measure results. So when something is accurate, that means that the results are close to a specific value. When we have very high tolerance or close tolerance parts, the tolerancing uh, restricts that uh, band in terms of uh, how much variation we can see in the process, and it forces the process to be uh, a little bit more accurate. Now, when we talk about precision, the difference is the uh, how close our measurements are to one another, not exactly how accurate uh, they are. So if we uh, look at this visually, uh, this bullseye example here that you see on the screen, uh, these are high accuracy results with low precision. So high accuracy because the means is centered right around that target value, that, that green area in the bullseye. Uh, but we can see there's a little bit of uh, scatter in the data points. Now in this slide here, we have low accuracy, okay? We're not centered on the, uh, the, the target in the center, but we have high precision. All of the measurements are close, uh, uh, close together. And sometimes in a lot of processes, Precision is more important than accuracy because we want to have the same results all the time. Now, when we get into very close tolerance uh, products, uh, we start moving more and more towards this high accuracy and high precision. Uh, and this is very difficult and very costly to, to achieve. So it's, it's more important in most manufacturing scenarios to have high precision, okay? And so what is the key to precision? How do we get uh, precision in our processes? The, the key to uh, precision processes is the control of input variables. We have to realize that uh, the metal stamping uh, process is just that, it is a process. So a process is a system of inputs and outputs. So this baby here on the screen, this is the, 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 the best analogy I've uh, seen of uh, inputs and outputs. This baby has inputs and outputs. So anyone that's ever been involved with childcare knows that we have inputs and outputs. Well, if you're not crazy about the output, I don't know how many of you uh, joining online have uh, seen the movie uh, Mr. Mom. Uh, 
but uh, in this scenario here, uh, he was not very happy with the output. And so what was necessary was to change the input. The evening before, he fed the baby chili. We don't feed babies chili. So if you want to change the output, you have to change the input. If you like the output, then you have to control the input. And this extends to all parts of the manufacturing process. Now, when we talk about a manufacturing process, okay, here's a simple uh, uh, way to look at it. We have inputs. They go into a process. You know, historically, this was some magic black box. You know, we put the dye in the press and magically we got a part to print. Uh, not in my lifetime, in my experience, but hopefully maybe some of you have had that experience, right? So we run through the process and then we get an output and then we need some feedback. And that's usually gonna be some type of measurement. So in a metal stamping process, what are our inputs? Well, obviously the sheet metal that we're uh, going to uh, uh, convert into a useful product. The press line that we're using, all the automation equipment, the feeds, the straighteners, the uncoilers, these are all part, part of the process. Uh, unfortunately, in the way that a lot of us with a tool and die background have been trained, uh, we've been trained into uh, building, uh, assembling, trying out, troubleshooting, debugging the die. And uh, we often forget that this is a process and the die is one part of the process. Uh, the problem when our experience is centered around only one part of the process, the die, for example, every problem we encounter in production, it's like a die problem because we're unaware of the other uh, inputs. So lubrication is also an a input variable. Uh, we change the lubrication, the amount, the position, how we're measuring it, that can all affect our processes. And then we have the process itself, the dies and the press. And even though that those are part of the process or the main components of the process, they have variables as well. How well is, it, is the equipment being maintained? How properly is it being used? How well do we document our setup and manufacturing procedures? And in most cases in metal stamping operations, the output is going to be some type of metal stamping. Now we need to determine, do we have the results that we're looking for? And typically we're going to be taking some type of measurements. And if the measurements are found to be acceptable, then the process continues to run. If the output or the dimensional results or whatever we're measuring as our output are not to uh, our desired uh, liking, uh, then we have to go back to the inputs and change an input to get a, uh, uh, an improved output. But this can be really daunting. And I like to use this example uh, a lot of a combination lock. Think about a combination lock. If I've got a combination lock with four tumblers, how many possible combinations are there? Well, each of these four tumblers have 10 positions on them, zero through nine. So I've got 10 times 10 is 100, times 10 is 1,000, times 10 is 10,000. So this combination lock has 10,000 different possible combinations, but only one opens the lock. And many of you out there uh, today have processes like this. There are only a few combinations of variables that will open this lock. And you'll know those processes uh, out on your shop floor. You'll recognize them immediately. Uh, these are the jobs when the die comes out for uh, maintenance, and it goes back uh, in the, into the press. Uh, we get it set up really quickly, and it's another hour and a half to get a good part. Uh, we change a coil, new coil change. We've got different dimensional results. We're making another 20, 25 minutes in adjustments, right? Because we have some process variables that are changing, and there's uh, only a few that work well for you. Now, fortunately for us, in most uh, stamping uh, scenarios, uh, the variables can be very robust. So small changes in material properties don't upset things. Small changes in lubrication properties may or may not up, up, upset things, but um, uh, there are 
combinations that uh, will give us undesirable results. Now, let's uh, take these tumblers on this lock. I like to break these into different uh, variables. So for example, setup accuracy. Uh, can you think of 10 things that you can vary in the setup that would affect the accuracy of that setup? If you think hard enough, it's pretty easy to come up with 10 things. It, the die's not uh, aligned properly. The pilot release isn't set properly. Uh, the feed rolls are slipping. There's, there's a number of variables uh, just in the setup. Uh, what about the design and the construction of the die? You know, how is the die uh, constructed? But more importantly, how is it being maintained? Also, how is the equipment being maintained? And not just the press. Keep in mind, we have a feed line that's involved as, as well. And what about our, about our die maintenance programs? Uh, unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, we strive towards die maintenance, but uh, in reality, we do very little die maintenance in many organizations uh, because what we're generally doing is die repair. And, um, and what that leads to is firefighting. If I'm fight, fight, fighting fires all the time, I don't have time to maintain the die. Right? So we can't maintain the dies because we're in production with something else that needs our attention. It's urgent. It has to be addressed. So uh, many things in die maintenance. So uh, think about it. This will give us 10,000 different combinations. And now what about our measurement methods? What types of equipment and devices are we using? Uh, are, 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 are they accurate? Are they being maintained? Are they being used properly? And probably, in my opinion, one of the more important uh, variables is documentation or control of our process. Are we documenting what produces the desired result? And if we just document it and we know what produces a uh, desired result, how are we controlling that within the organization? Because we can't have a scenario where we're trying to keep a process running and Jack makes uh, certain changes to keep the process running, but Paul does it a different way. And maybe Cheryl has her way of, of uh, adjusting the process. It has to be standardized because remember, we're trying to reduce our, our variables or control them. So that's going to require standardization and that standardization we're going to find in our documentation. So on the die side, and it's this not understanding the uh, importance or communicating the importance of certain variability in our processes that pre prevents us from really finding root cause to the problems that we have. Now, from a die construction uh, viewpoint, I pull this from my uh, uh, designing, uh, maintaining a die seminar. Uh, Three things that I emphasize is that our die components have to be uh, uh, designed and constructed, not just designed, designed and constructed in a manner that assures reproducibility, reliability, and repeatability. Now, those three terms, they all sound similar, but they have fairly different meanings. So when we're talking about having reproducibility, that means the tool or component can be replicated and regardless of uh, who makes them, the tool will work. Now, what's required to do this is really a uh, very detailed documentation. So you'll notice uh, the second line I have, uh, reproducibility requires extremely detailed component part prints. And it's not by accident that I replace the S's with a dollar sign. This is costly, right? And it's one reason a lot of organizations may look past this because it requires a lot of um, uh, cost. So what does that mean? If I've got a drawing, uh, that means I have to have all the dimensions, the tolerances. What is the surface finish that I need? What corners need to be uh, broken? Even describe the manufacturing process. We're gonna rough machine, then we're gonna stress relieve. Then we're going to finish machine, right? And, and then we're going to go out, out to heat. What is the process? Because if that process produces the desirable uh, 
uh, result. We don't want to go from uh, rough machining to finished machining and then heat treat. And then we have uh, a lot of movement in the component during heat treat. So that's the purpose of having the stress relief process in between. That needs to be documented. Uh, when we heat treat, what are the specifications? And how are we, it can't just be 58 Rockwell C. There's a lot of ways to get to 58 Rockwell C. So should this be uh, two tempers? Should it be three tempers? Uh, do we wanna make sure that all of our heat treatment is being done in a, a six bar vacuum furnace? Uh, these are the types of things that need to be documented and controlled to assure that we get the exact same component each time. So this means the result is if the part is to the print that we created, it will be exactly the same every time, no matter who makes it, if I make it in house or if I send it to the machine shop down the street. Now, reliability uh, is more design uh, related. We need to make sure that the component is designed so it won't flex, chip, break, deform, crack. So uh, that is a design function to, as well as we can, design out weak areas to avoid catastrophic failures. And repeatability means that all the tooling components can be serviced, they can be changed over and replaced every time by any tool maker and achieve the same results. So the analogy I use in some of my uh, uh, seminars is uh, an oil change. We go into a shop for an oil change. It doesn't matter who does the oil change. They've got the right filter. We get the same results no matter where we go or who does it, right? So that is uh, what we're trying to achieve with our tooling. And this doesn't uh, apply just to tooling. I'm identifying tooling here, but it can apply to every aspect of our uh, process. How are, we, how are we ensuring that our, our setups are uh, reliable and repeatable? How are we documenting? How are we measuring? Uh, these become important aspects of controlling variables. Typically, we don't see our sampling process as a collection of, of highly interactive uh, inputs, but it, uh, in reality, uh, that's what we're dealing with. So um, at this time, I, I, I think uh, I'd like to just recognize our uh, panelists, uh, uh, Stephen, Paul, and Jeff are both uh, uh, are all joining us uh, today, but um, I would like to take uh, the opportunity here to uh, uh, ask Stephen, uh, before we uh, came on and went live, uh, you and I had a discussion about uh, the importance of documentation. And uh, so maybe you can share with uh, our, our viewers uh, some of the steps that uh, YSOG has taken towards improving their documentation. Sure. So definitely one of the problems that we've had um, over the time, right, is you, you go into uh, the press, you run something, a part a component breaks, and then you launch a new component, put it in the tool, and you get a completely different result. A lot of times um, that could be either somebody launched a, the wrong revision, uh, could also be, you know, hey, what was in there was an experiment that somebody had done and never went back and updated uh, the component drawing itself to, to a next ref level. Um, and a lot of that comes from um, some of the older tooling design files. I mean, I, I happen to actually be a designer, um, so I, I deal with this on an everyday basis. But um, what would happen is a lot of the design files of previous uh, tools might be split up of 360 different files. Um, and the issue becomes, especially when people start doing experiments of, hey, I'm, I'm going to kind of go in a different route here, find out if I can fix something. Uh, they end up working outside in, in another folder, subfolder somewhere. Okay, and it never makes it back into the tool. And it becomes, unless you know that that folder exists, it can become very difficult to find it because you have to know it's there first. So one of the things that I, I've actually, um, still in the process of working on right now is, uh, I happen to work a lot in 2D, I do 3D as well, but majority of, of the tool designs I, I keep in 2D. And the beauty of today's 2D CAD systems um, is it's an infinite space. Model space is infinite. So I've actually gotten rid of all of these, uh, or, you know, tons of files and we've gotten down to one tooling file. And the entire uh, book, essentially, the, we call them the, the design books, the tooling books, basically exist in the file structure itself. So basically all the way at the top, we start with the strip layout. Then I move down to station one, which has a, you know, a station overview map. 
and then you know all the components that go along with it to the side station two, all the components and so on and so forth. And this way, there is no confusion. It's you want to work on that tool from a designer or a CAD perspective. There's one file and all of your experiments that may be done in that particular station, whatever it is, you would work in a little area to the side. But that way, at least, you know, everything is right there. There's nowhere else it can be. There's nowhere else that can exist. Um, it kind of forces everybody to the same CAD system. I run into that as well, uh, where basically you have one designer that says, hey, I'm, I'm more comfortable in 3D. So hey, there's already 300 different files. I'm just going to add another one. Um, and on top of it, they'll work in, in a different CAD system entirely. Uh, whereas, you know, this kind of system uh, forces, no matter who touches the file, you know that it's always going to be uh, contained in that file. And you always at least have a shot of finding a component, even if it's an experiment off to the side. Um, that has actually helped streamline a lot of our uh, downtime tooling because, you know, the presses aren't moving. No, nope, mm -hmm. we're not making money. Um, yeah. So it's, it's all about that. It's, it's the efficiency because, as you had mentioned, uh, before with documentation money, it's money and time because there's nothing like losing a spot in wire EDM. Okay, for that was cutting a component that was useless because it was wrong. Um, and and the, the trouble is, I already kicked someone out of the, the wire EDM queue, you know, because again, firefighting, it's all about firefighting. So, hey, I have an emergency. I need to get in tonight. You know, I'm going to kick someone else out of the way and I get the component in the morning and it's wrong. There's nothing more frustrating than that. Uh, so do definitely documentation, I think, is really where it starts. Because if your documentation isn't solid, you know, it, it just compounds from there. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good uh, uh, explanation. So uh, what I took from that is, you know, the, the documentation is an important aspect, uh, as, as we discussed. But you have variables, the preferences for different uh, uh, tooling engineers or die makers. Uh, in terms of how they want to approach things and their tools, the, the CAD system. So uh, it's kind of a daunting challenge uh, for your organization, I imagine. And a lot of organizations, uh, I think we want really quick results. And I'm assuming you didn't get really quick results. So uh, uh, my questions would be, uh, one, how long would you uh, say it took to really see some uh, results from uh, this effort? And uh, two, uh, what were those results? What were you able to uh, uh, benefit from? What, what have you seen? So one of the major benefits, um, you know, because we, we saw black books that are on the, the tool uh, floor itself. And in theory, um, every time you make a revision to a bar print, somebody's supposed to print, you know, a, a, a piece of paper out and replace that paper. It and seems no matter where you go, those books are black. <laughs> every time I see them, they're black. <laughs> um, the, the problem is, of course, that that doesn't always occur. Um, as well as it should. So that's kind of one of the, the major benefits immediately that I saw, um, sp particularly with the tool and die makers that are much more comfortable, you know, logging into the CAD system and viewing it, is um, they don't even use the black book. They just log right into my file. We, we have the, the system set up that the moment they open that CAD file, it's read only. So they can, you know, so long as they, they have, they're using their Windows login, they can't edit the files, but they can view it all day long. Um, and they don't even use the black book. They literally assemble the tool right from the CAD file. Um, and what makes that nicer as well is because, I mean, I've been in the, the tool and die trade for 12 years now. Um, I've had a lot of uh, tooling guys yell at me, uh, only by the ear for making them, you know, do certain things. Uh, but regardless, I still am not the guy on, on the, you know, the, the surface grinder grinding things. So it allows them to cue their own dimensions. If, if it, uh, again, if I didn't dimension something in such a way, uh, you know, they're going to spark off on a corner and they want uh, a, you know, a, a pot noose line, whatever you want to call it, a cord uh, length as opposed to an X and a Y dimension. They just go and, you know, hey, I know I'm going to put this thing up on a 45, spark off on a corner and just drop in that way and allows them to just come up with their own numbers without having to get engineering involved every step of the way. Um, because I always say, you know, I'm looking, the tool and die maker really is supposed to be an expert in their field too. Um, and it's not just meant, you know, here's a print and you're just going to make something right to print uh, per se. You know, it's, it's uh, again, cue your own dimensions that you need. But the, the biggest benefit of it all, all is that that file is always up to date. There, when I go in and edit something in that CAD file, it's always the most up to date model. I, there's no lag in printing time or somebody forgot to do something. Um, so that's, that's been one of the major improvements. And, and really, we're doing it from new tools. 
going forward and on certain older programs, if it makes sense, I'll go back and um, kind of restructure the files that way. It is uh, something that we're also doing to the side um, because we have seen such positive results on the newer tools that we're doing it to. Um, but that in itself is a daunting task when, again, you have 300 plus you know, legacy dies. Uh, so really it's been from this point going forward and if it makes sense with some older dies, we reformat the, the tooling files as well. Good, good success story. Yep. Good deal. Thanks, guys, for, for that conversation. We are going to pick up this topic of um, reproducibility and reliability in, in terms of tooling. Uh, but before we do that, we've got one more, it's a one minute sponsor message from Universal Robots, and then we'll come back. We'll talk to Jeff Umler at Walker Tool and Die about what they're doing uh, to improve the reproducibility and reliability of their tools. So please enjoy this one minute sponsor video from Universal Robots. Jeff, though, I do want to uh, and thank Stephen for, for sharing your, your story on uh, documentation and, and uh, Pete for your, your really good presentation as usual. Um, and certainly want to encourage everyone again, please, that would be a good time to queue up any questions for, for Pete or Stephen on, on what we've covered so far. We do want to make this as interactive as possible and we're here to answer your questions. So please go ahead and use that question panel in your Zoom, uh, in your Zoom window. Um, and, and we'll take your questions as we get them in. So Jeff, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and tell us a little bit about some of the best practices uh, that you've been implementing at Walker Tool & Die uh, to help your stamping customers uh, ensure precision in, in their stampings. Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, it's an honor to be here on this panel. You know, th thanks for inviting me. Um, you know, some of the things that, that we, that we've done at Walker, you know, Pete kind of hit on in, in his PowerPoint presentation as well is, you know, it starts with the design intent. You know, we, we have to have a, a robust tool that's designed and that's going to last a long time and produce an accurate part for our customer. Um, you know, so as, as we go through our designs, we look at press adjustability, um, you know, material types, the stuff like that. Um, you know, we, we always use auto form simulation in the beginning for spring back feasibility, trim line development. Um, one thing that, that we also do once we kind of get into tryout is if if we go into have to go into a quality loop to adjust part quality, we are going back up into the CAD file. We're making the modifications there and we're going back through the CNC department. That way, what we have on the floor matches what we have in our die design file. And we just find that that's much more accurate for us. Um, probably the biggest thing we we did um, started a couple years ago is kind of in our machining process, though. Um, we switched all of our work holding over to a WOW work holding, which is kind of an FCS-based type work holding. Um, Find, we found that it was much more accurate and repeatable, you know, as far as the details going on and off the machine. Um, all of our form details, we cut, we finish cut after heat treat to take that heat treat process out of there. Um, and then we'll either do some probe checks or sometimes go into our CMM lab and scan the details. So before we even go in the press for tryout, we know we have what we want coming out that machine. 
because the worst thing that can happen is to have a die maker in there grinding on a post for hours, come to find out that it wasn't accurate off the machine. And, you know, then, then nobody knows where, where that's at. Um, so those, those are big things that have really reduced our spotting and our tryout time because the, your, your stamp part's only going to be as accurate as the details that it's getting thrown around. Um, so that's that's kind of kind of some of the main things that that we have done at Walker to to help with the tighter tolerances, you know, tougher materials that we're seeing nowadays, and everything else. Good, thank you for all that. You mentioned um, you mentioned the, uh, the uh, cutting after uh, heat treat to kind of take the heat treat out of the equation. How long have you? been doing that and what have been some of the results of, of, uh, of that best practice so we've been we've been doing that for for a long time on a case by case um basis i would say within the last probably four or five years we've done it on all form steels and what we've seen is just a a drastic reduction in spotting in the press and you know for trial I mean, we'd have that's, something that maybe would take a, a week and we're in there, in and out of there, and, you know, a couple shifts, you know, like that first shift, second shift type thing. So that's a lead time issue as much as anything else in terms of turnaround to your stamping customers. Yes. Yep, it is. I mean, it, it takes more time on the, on the CNC machines, but we just, we kind of, we adjust our timelines accordingly. We kind of give machining a little bit more time than what they had, have had in the past. And, you know, the, the die makers end up with a little less time, but they don't need as much now. So there's less hand work involved. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah. at Weissog, are you, um, are you guys making your own tooling or are you, yeah, so are you doing any of these things as well? Yes. So we, we also have, um, you know, same thing. We don't process anything in the soft state other than, you know, blocks that don't really mean much, such as adjustment blocks that are, you know, we have threads in them. Uh, that's basically the only things uh, that we do in soft state. So a lot of it, again, wire EDM, uh, you know, directly into hard steel or, or carbide. Um, the other things is, you know, we, we, uh, we have actually a, a Yazda, um, I forget the exact model name, but uh, it's a high speed uh, milling center. Um, that we can, you know, the claim to fame with that, though I've never seen, haven't seen it done, is you can uh, take an 8,000th ball end mill and actually mill directly into to carbide. Um, and really what that allows us to do is machine directly into steels or carbides, uh, you know, to exactly what, what Jeff's point is, um, you know, it's to take that variability out of it. And then the other obvious uh, processes is EDM sinking um, or whatever, you know, other processes grinding. Uh, but it typically, yes, it's all done in the hardened state. Um, be, because again, the last thing I want to deal with, um, you know, is it, it changes on me, right? And then even coupled with both, uh, both Jeff's uh, comments is, uh, you know, the, the repeatability of taking it off and measuring it. Um, you know, when you have those dies that, yeah, it takes you, uh, you know, days uh, to get back as soon as you change a process. Um, you know, one of the things that we've done, particularly with those dies that we know there are going to be those types of dies when they're built, is before you uh, ever go in uh, to the press the first time, you take those critical forming components and you measure them on, on a CMF. Uh, because we have run into that situation before where you end up um, grooming an entire process uh, to the, the tooling that you have built. And then, you know, the day that one of those critical components breaks and then you, you spare, you know, you take a spare and put it in there, you have a completely different part, only to find out when you went back and remeasured the component that broke in half, you know, the pickup originally was three thousandths off in the X direction. And you groomed an entire tool and process around that because you just assumed everything uh, that came off of a machining operation was correct. Uh, so, yeah, that's absolutely a... a we use a 3R system, but, you know, same thing. I think that's absolutely critical is don't just assume that everything comes off, that comes off a machine is correct. You have to check it. But yep. Good. Same, same experience. Good. Thanks. Jeff, anything else to add? Cover it. Um, no, I guess the only other thing would be is that if we do get into a situation where there is some handwork that, that needs to be done, we will scan those details 
at the end of the job and reverse engineer them. So the, the tool that ships out the door matches 100% to the CAD design, you know, that we have on file and that we send to the customer. What are you using to scan those details? Is it white light? Um, we have an ATOS blue light scanner blue that light. we use. Yep. Good deal. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so now I want to turn it over to Paul at, at uh, Nikon, um, who uh, is going to tell us a little bit about what they're doing uh, to use his term of uh, de-skilling metrology on the shop floor, some uh, imaging and laser scanning technology that is available uh, to metal formers. So Paul, uh, tell us about the de-skilling of, of metrology from, from Nikon's perspective. Yeah, thanks, 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 Brad. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I want to touch on sort of five general trends within metrology, um, and uh, you know, how these link into what you know, the, like Stephen, Pete, and Jeff have already been talking about. Um, but uh, first off, just to say that you know, metrology is a necessary evil, uh, or it's seen as a necessary evil. Um, you know, nickel metrology exists because the world is not perfect. Uh, you know, if, if everything was perfect, I would be out of a job. So it's, <laughs> in a way, it's, it's good that we have uh, these uh, discrepancies. Um, but yeah, it, it's all about how to, as I say, de-skill, uh, more automation, and how we're working through. Um, and the first sort of general trend in that is the move from touch to non-contact um, measurement. So touch could be, you know, it could be a, a, a tape measure, it could be a, a caliper, a, a feeler gauge, um, and you know they want to go. You know, the industries want to go away from that to non-contact. Uh, Jeff talked about using a scanning to to measure the dyes, um, and it's most of that it is for speed, um, but also it does help with de-skilling um, because there's more uh, there's sort of more tolerance within the scanning. Uh, capabilities but it's not just scanning um, you know we the, the our laser radar device is a single point non-contact long-range measurement device uh, but we also do you know we, we're talking x-ray machines so we're looking inside and outside um, but also you know video measurement machines microscopes so especially within Nikon we've moved to this non-contact almost completely non-contact offering um, which you know, it's where the industry is, is pushing us to go. Now that doesn't mean you know doesn't come without its complications. Um, there are differences between measurement with a contact device, a traditional CMM, and scanning type devices, and that's you know part of the challenges we're having to overcome to to look and and um, change how we measure and and how uh, our customers measure. So that's sort of the first thing that we see as a change. Um, Second thing is a move from manual measurements to automated measurements. Um, now, this is possibly one of the biggest things in descaling. Uh, you know, anytime you're using a manual measurement, um, and uh, you know, Pete touched on this. You know, if you've got three different people measuring something manually, you might get three different answers. Whereas if you can automate it, and all you're doing is pressing a button, then you're precision becomes much better. Uh, your repeatability, your reproducibility becomes a lot better. And that's the same whether it's manufacturing or metrology. So it doesn't really matter which way it is, but yeah, automation is a big key to, to doing this de-skilling. Um, and there's also this move from, and uh, Pete talked about you know, precision and precision is good, that's the main thing. Accuracy is nice to have, but you know, precision is, is important. Um, but in metrology, we're seeing a push from the manufacturers to, to have both. They want everything, <laughs> which is, you know, that's, and that's a, you know, it's a challenge for us. Um, but you can also think about that as a move from relative sensors um, to um, traceable or absolute sensors, where you're not just looking at, um, you know, where is this hole relative to this one in a GD&T, you're looking generally where is everything relative to everything else. Um, and that's again, that's a that's a big challenge uh, for us to look at that. Um, fourthly, there's a move to to move away from the metrology room into and on the shop floor. So have the metrology available quickly and as you need it. 
um i think uh, Stephen touched on you know if you you're you know it takes a while to go and get that dye measured and i think jeff touched on it as well you know if you want to measure that dye going to a metrology room onto a cmm you know that might take a whole sh a whole shift to get that measured um so you know we're looking at ways of you know can we reduce that time and you know laser radar in automotive not just in the um not just in the, the sort of stamping area but you know we're reducing times by factors of four and six of those measurements so it's a real powerful thing to do um to get the information faster because it's about reacting and you know feedback is you need that feedback as as pete said but that feedback needs to be quick you know if the, the, if you haven't got that feedback you're either producing parts that are useless or you're producing parts that need rework or you're not producing parts because you're waiting so that all you know that that move to get the metrology as close as possible to the to what you're making is is a big one um and then finally uh, more as a general from from the, our, our manufacturing side is the move from us to from providing devices to providing solutions um and that's a big thing with de-skilling you know we can we can produce a fantastic scanner or a laser radar you know if we just give that to you it's like you still need the skills to be able to use that correctly and get the right measurements whereas if we can provide you with a solution that means that we're looking at what do you need from us and we can build the specific solution for your measurement and so it becomes a you know just a single push button process it's a it's a turnkey process to do all that um and really it's you know it's all about the same thing we we want to try and reduce that variability generally through automation uh, through the non contact but still producing high accuracy devices so that you're getting the measurements that you need within the time that you need it so it's timely measurements but those are what, what we see is the the general trends within metrology um, which you know relate exactly to what everybody's been saying so far so it's uh, yeah it's uh, all, all links in good thanks paul so i'm curious to learn a little bit more about the de-skilling concept is it a custom solution per customer or uh, is it an overall trend in the technology development that de-skills the metrology process? It's it's an it's an overall trend, um, and it's it's by building a little bit more intelligence into um, the metrology device or the software or the setup. Um, so it's yeah, it's simplifying how you set something up. So you know, from from if you're using a contact device, then you know you've got to think about well, where do I need to measure and and how do I move the path so I'm not going to hit anything? So there's a lot of complications with doing that. Now that, yeah, there are automated programming um, things, but non-contact makes that a lot easier. You know, the, the, the ultimate thing is x-ray, where you just put it in, you put it in, and then it measures, you know, it measures everything inside and outside. But, you know, that's difficult because, you know, these are big machines, they're expensive machines. Um, they are limited on the size of the part they can put in. Um, but that's really about the, the, the de-skilling. The solutions provide that de-skilling. And they can be, you know, they can be relatively generic. Um, but generally, you're looking at something for, for the particular industry. And it's, it's about the size of parts, really. You know, if you've got a large part, you need a, a, a bigger solution than if you were dealing with small, tiny little widgets uh, on that. So we, we, you know, we're looking at providing, depending on the technology, it might be a video measurement system solution, it could be a, a laser radar solution for larger parts, it could be a scanning solution. So, you know, it's, it's looking at the right solution for the customer, as opposed to the customer saying, oh, can I buy that machine? It's like, well, actually, what's your problem? You know, what are you trying to solve? And we're trying to say, well, actually, okay, so we can build something around that, or we have something that we can customize or modify to, to provide you with exactly what you need and that's the thing and the solution is you know it's part customization part um uh, part standard within that sure thank you good you guys have any questions for, for jeff or paul related to what we just heard uh, i just have uh, a comment on um something that paul had mentioned so uh paul had mentioned uh, made a reference in terms of, you know, 
uh, making uh, measurements in that, and it depended on you know what your customer is looking for. Uh, what we need to be aware of in our stamping plants is that we have both internal and external customers. So um, I showed on my first slide, uh, you know, in, uh, in my past, I was involved with automotive steering column uh, assemblies. And so uh, internally, our stamping department would make parts to print and we would struggle with building assemblies. So, you know, uh, the, the welding or the assembly department becomes the customer then. And so that particular customer uh, doesn't want, we didn't want a part to print, we wanted the same part every time. Because if the part's on one side of the tolerance, then on the other side of the tolerance, if you've got complex assembly equipment or just it could be simple welding fixtures, uh, you're constantly making adjustments to fixtures to deal with that, that, that variation. And uh, uh, the other thing that, that uh, uh, made me remember that, that uh, Paul mentioned is, you know, there's a push towards uh, precision and accuracy and bringing them together. Uh, we had a situation uh, once where uh, we tried to make that a focus internally at our, our, our organization, and we were uh, very precise, okay? We had a very good process capability, but we weren't near the, 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 the nominal. And we made a change to the uh, uh, process. Uh, we made some upgrades and, and we began to be able to center the process. And it was like, wow, this looks fantastic. The customer will be so happy. And same thing that we saw internally, uh, the customer was not happy mm -hmm. because that's great that you gave me a part that's accurate and precise, but I want the precision part all the time. Right now, you gave me something that I, I'm going to have to make adjustments to my process uh, on. So that's why earlier I said in, in a lot of processes, precision is good enough because I'm getting the same part all the time, and I can uh, 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 you know work with that. Uh, if we're targeting both, which is a, a good uh, objective, and our customers kind of force us to do that as they tighten up the tolerances. So what they're saying is, we want you closer and closer to. Uh, to nominal, uh, we want to uh, strive to achieve that in the beginning of the uh, product launch because uh, we got a number of assembly uh, components. Uh, the process is going to be tuned into where the current state of all their uh, components uh, are at that time, and uh, at that time, and you don't want to be making uh, deviations from that because then you become an input variable to your customer's process. I have one other comment as well, if I can. Please. So just, just in, it, it, to build on what Paul had mentioned with the de-skilling, um, I think that's absolutely great. I definitely have seen, you know, in, in uh, our shop, you know, the de-skilling of uh, the measurement and metrology uh, portion has been phenomenal. But, I, you know, the one thing I just want to say is de-skilling doesn't mean a non-skilled individual. Um, you can't just find, you know, somebody on the street as a temp and put them in front of a, a measurement device and say, oh, now all you have to do is push a button. Um, you know, a pro small example I, I, I ran into a couple months ago was, you know, the, the operator would submit parts to QC. QC set up, you know, same thing. They had an operator in there pushing a button. Oh, you have to make this adjustment. And three days went back and forth. Of the adjustment's not doing anything to the part. I pulled the die out. It's got to go to die repair. The adjustment isn't working. Uh, all set to find out when engineering finally got involved and really dove into the problem. Um, the smart scope just wasn't even picking up the right edge. Uh, and again, because people got lazy uh, and just relied on the automation. And where I think the de-skilling really comes into play is, you know, 10 years ago, I needed somebody that was a CMM program. And that is all they did because that in itself was a full-time job. And they ne didn't necessarily have the tie over to the stamping world, you know, so there was an interpreter that kind of needed to be in the middle and and juggle uh, both aspects. And I think that de skilling is such a great thing that's coming out of the industry um, because now what it'll, it really allows us to do is, you know, take the operator that's on the floor and go to an on the floor inspection piece of equipment and drive his own adjustments, okay? Not relying on a QC guy. So it's de skilling is in terms of what's required to get into the metrology, but overall, you're actually enhancing the skills of the individuals by allowing them to be not only press operators. Uh, you know, even getting to understand tooling, but then also to be their own metrologists. 
Um, and, and that's really, you know, that de-skilling is, is, can be such a, a weird word. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that, that's, that's really the one takeaway that I wanted to say. I think it's great what you guys are doing with metrology because even me today, you know, I, 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 I'm a little bit of a metrologist myself, you know, <laughs> and it's because of, of what you guys are doing. Yeah, I and think, I, I think that's that's the, the same for, you know, across, you know, people are scared of de-skilling. They think, oh, that means I, you know, I'm going to get paid less or you're going to be in, in, employ someone with with less less skills and pay them less and I'm going to be out of a job. It's not about that. As you, as you, as you said, Stephen, it's about more about, you know, changing skills and spreading those skills out. You know, when people think about, oh, you know, bringing robots in to do to manufacture cars, it's like, oh, that's going to put loads of people out of a job. Well, actually, it's going to move people's jobs. They're going to have to learn how to deal with the robots. They're actually their own skills are going to increase. You know, they're, they're, there's opportunities to, to be more skilled. Yes, there's de-skilling of the process, but yeah, the the operators, you still need the operators to program it. You still need, you know, the metrologists are still there needed to do the, the deep dive, but they're not then required to do the pushing of the button. You can spread those skills out, which is which is great. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, this is a, a, a great discussion. Um, and, and maybe uh, de-skilling isn't the, uh, 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 best term, maybe it's, it's right skilling, because what all of this reminds me of is, um, and, and uh, Jeff can, can relate to, to this, uh, because he had mentioned earlier that, you know, they rely a lot on metal forming simulations now, which are, you know, mainstream in our industry. But in the uh, uh, late 80s and early 90s, when metal forming simulations were in their infancy, uh, the only people that could run uh, these codes were CAE specialists uh, which P with PhDs. And the drive was to how do we push this down to more of a shop floor level, right? So, uh, and right skill it so a, a die designer or a die engineer can, can use it. It's, it's great that uh, someone with a PhD in finite element modeling can, you know, set up the problem and spit out a result. They don't have the background of how a tool works. So we needed to get it down to the right person. And I kind of think this is what you're, you're saying. We're not really uh, de-skilling uh, in terms of, now the PhD probably thought that, you know, uh, the processes uh, got de-skilled because, you know, now we were able to get them in the uh, in, in the right place. But um, uh, again, I, I think that's uh, uh, a good place for it to be. Um, uh, Stephen and I were talking at uh, a lunchtime today uh, about how uh, our reliance on things are, our reliance on metal forming simulations, our reliance on our uh, quality, our metrology uh, devices. Uh, what we have to be uh, careful of I think we're all aware of when computers first came out, uh, we all used uh, uh, the acronym GIGO, you know, garbage in, garbage out. That still exists today, except in my opinion, GIGO has a different meaning when we're talking about these kinds of technologies like metrology and metal forming simulation. And the danger is it's garbage in, gospel out. The simulation says it should work. The measurement device says it's correct. It's, but there are other things that we set it up properly for the measurement device to, to measure it. Uh, so we got to be real careful because um, there is less reliance on understanding the background uh, behind the things that, that, that we're doing. And uh, as Stephen said, you know, uh, they relied on a measurement. Uh, result and made changes to the tooling. And here they found out that the uh, equipment, the program uh, was measuring on an edge or a surface or something, measuring in the wrong place, but nobody questioned it, right? Because it said it was out and that becomes the gospel. So we got to be uh, very cognizant of that. You know, that's a great point too. I mean, we're, we're really utilizing, you know, our die makers to be critical thinkers out there and read that CMM report and the scam report and, you know, kind of work back with die design on what moves to make during a quality move. 
And so they've, they've got to understand all of that for sure. Good, thanks. We do have a couple of questions from the audience. I want to make sure we address those before we get too, too much further into this. Um, the first question I think is, is for Stephen. They want to know what kind of CAD system you guys are using. Yep. So uh, the question was which CAD systems we're using. And um, specifically, I, I use uh, DraftSite and AutoCAD. Um, we, and to me, that's more of a preference to the individuals because to me, they're both the same systems. Uh, DraftSite just being uh, Dassault Systems 2D uh, CAD uh, package. Um, and SolidWorks is the other big one in 3D. And though you know, I, I had mentioned that we do a lot of our CAD designs uh, in 2D, and that's how I control the overall uh, CAD design. Obviously, there are many components, unfortunately, uh, well, not unfortunately, but uh, I don't produce flat parts or very little time, so I produce flat parts. Uh, so again, anytime we deal with a piece of tooling that, um, again, is moving about more than one axis uh, at a time, um, it's physically impossible to really uh, depict that accurately in 2D. So yes, in those cases, uh, the overall component would still be controlled in a 2D fashion, such as you know the overall height, the widths, um, again, if I'm to Pete's point before, we also happen to control uh, the processes of how we produce that tooling on the print. So if there's a particular view that, hey, I wire this in this view, and that's the first step that's called out on the print, and that's all controlled in 2D. And then what we'll do is the one face that has to be machined or uh, sunk EDM, um, I'll point to it and just say, you know, refer to file, blah, 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 in this location uh, for the machining path. And literally, I utilize that 3D model for the machining face only. Every other aspect would be controlled by, by 2D. Now, that's just a preference. I've seen plenty of 3D designs that the entire tool is done in 3D. But um, again, to answer your question, AutoCAD and, and uh, DraftSite, and then we use SolidWorks for our 3D platform. Good, thank you. And I don't know, maybe this is for Paul or um, anybody really. The status of CT scanning of stamp parts um, in terms of cost and accuracy and speed, anybody want to maybe call or anybody else want to comment on where they see CT scanning as stamp parts in terms of cost accuracy? Well, yeah, I was like, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a CT, uh, I'm not a CT expert. There's many of my colleagues who, who, who like live this and breathe sure. this. Um, but uh, generally, with with CT, it's it's uh, as with a lot of things, about the size of parts. So that's that's the restriction, the big restriction at the moment is that the size of the parts that you can measure. I mean, metal is not a problem anymore. You can do high power stuff. Um, but yeah, the larger the parts, the longer it's gonna to take to measure. And actually the more accuracy you require, the longer it's gonna to take to measure. Um, I mean, I think at the moment, you you know, the larger parts might take, you know, might take, you know, 10, 15 minutes to measure sort of thing and then analyze and there's more time there. So it's not, it's not really um, a good solution for larger parts for, um 100 inspection um, um now we we've seen um customers are buying it not so much in the stamping but in the casting area because they're looking for voids and that sort of thing where the inside is is important um but yeah typically the cts are being used a lot for um sort of first off inspection analysis those those initial ones where you have more time to do it but running it as a as an inline system at the moment, it's you know it's, it's a big challenge for us, and we're trying to look at how can we increase the speed of that. But yeah, the, the specific details, I'm not I'm not too. So I don't want to go into <laughs> too much in, in case I'm, I'm saying the wrong things here. But uh, you know, we at, at Nikon, we have plenty of experts who will be happy to to uh, to answer that if you have any specific questions. You can get in touch with our sales teams and our technical teams for that. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else have comments on CT scan? I mean, we, we're actually in the process of researching. We've, we've been uh, dealing with CT for quite a while, and um, more so, it's been customer like our customers that we're producing the parts for CT scan the parts that we send them. Mm. Um, and in some cases, I and mean, we, we happen to actually be a, a insert holder as well. Um, and in that case, it makes a lot of sense because it's about you know seeing the metal inside the plastic. Um, you know, because sometimes the metal deforms from just the injection pressures. Uh, and things of that nature. So in that case, it's been useful. But as Paul had mentioned, I know one of the the biggest uh, barriers to get into it from a metal stamping perspective has been speed. Because all said and done, I mean, some of these scans can still take, I, I mean, it depends on the size of the part. I, I don't know as low as three minutes, but I, I know one particular one that I tried was, was over 20 minutes for a scan. And 
the, the way that I, you know, again, I've been going back and forth with some um, you know, manufacturers that, that make the CT scanner, their solution has been automation within the CT scanner itself. So they make automated tables. So, hey, you know, load up all these parts overnight and then let, let all the scans occur overnight when everybody leaves. Um, that's good and it's great. Uh, but if you're actually dealing with a die that has problems, that's not really all that responsive. Um, if it's more just a, hey, this is the run of the mill job. I've been running it for 20 years. I know this tool produces, uh, you know, good parts and I really just need a data report to go with the parts that I ship out. Then yeah, it's a, it's a great tool, but um, I've pretty much, you know, the, the uh, interaction that I've had with it, it can be great for uh, analyzing and grooming particular problem areas down to an extremely small uh, point. Um, but it has, I have not seen it get to a point where it's, it's great for inline inspection. Um, it's not fast enough yet, by experience. So, okay, yeah. good, thank you. Um, I guess continuing on that conversation in terms of inline or, or inspection on the shop floor, I know leading up to this event, we talked a little bit about your goal, I guess, to, to move some of this uh, inspection onto the shop floor. I think you said you were looking at maybe automated vision systems. Did you want to talk a little bit more about sure. your plan for? Yep. So we're, we're actually in, in the process of, uh, you know, to Paul's point, um, trying to bring some of that equipment on the shop floor. So. And this all has to go back to, you know, engagement with uh, the operators themselves, right? So, um, you know, I want them to be able to make adjustments on, on, on the, the fly. I want them to, you know, understand, you know, to some semblance, when do I really need to call, uh, call a die maker over here because I really have a tooling problem or, hey, it's actually a setup issue. Uh, and, and so another aspect that is bringing the metrology um, at their fingertips so that they can use that as well, because to me, the operator is your first line of defense when it comes to running parts and making good product. Um, so one of the, the pieces of equipment that we're looking at right now, um, you know, it's, it's uh, a tabletop. I don't know what they're called, but it is a vision system that you can basically put a part on a platform and a camera looks at it from the top and you can basically um, automatically take a whole bunch of dimensions. Some systems will actually, you don't even have to find a program and auto detect uh, the shape of the part and, and automatically pull a program up. Uh, but the, re the reason why we're trying to do that is because um, that whole concept of, you know, de-skilling and, well, my job is just to get parts that ring out of the bottom of the press and I'm going to walk over to QC and, um, and hand them over, uh, that has actually created a lot of efficiency problems on our floor. Um, so much so that it became, like, apparent. Uh, there was no question about a lot of efficiencies were being lost in the QC aspect because um, some of these smart scope programs um, can take, I, I've seen as, some as long as two minutes apart. But when you string up, you know, six parts, because again, we're, we're dealing with high, high speed stampings. Um, so again, we may have to measure six parts for every lot. Well, now you're talking a 13 minute, you know, inspection um, uh, program. Well, if all said and done, I could have taken that part one and either just gone under a microscope, which is another aspect of it, and just visually looked at it and told you it wasn't right. Uh, or just taking a couple of dimensions, you know, before I wasted 13 minutes of time of, of QC's time, um, that, that's really what happens because all QC does is say, hey, you got to make an adjustment to, you know, these two or three dimensions and come back in again. And it, it really goes back to my whole discussion, even with tooling on the wire EDM side is, well, I kick someone out for their spot in wire EDM and really all said none, it was the wrong component that came out. I, I have to get back into wire EDM again. QC is no different with some of these smart scopes. Um, you know, so it was all about what we're really trying to do is build confidence uh, at the operator level before you submit parts to QC. I, I really want QC to be the final check off to say, yes, these parts are good. Here's the inspection report, ship the parts out. Now, mind you, that's, that's in a perfect world, uh, but as close as I can get to that point, that's what I'm striving for. I, I, we're really trying to get to a point where don't waste that 13 minutes of QC time because as, as anything, you know, these smart scopes machines themselves you know, they're, they're not cheap machines and they take up floor space as well. So I don't have thousands of them scattered around, um, you know, the building. Uh, so again, they're a very hot commodity to get in. Uh, there is a long line behind them and there's nothing worse than, than it's twofold. One, you know, there's nothing worse than the guy who says, because it's a high risk job, let's say we, the part is plated in gold. Okay. Um, 
So there is no running at risk. It's you, we need QC sign off because one, one coil of material can be equated to $13,000. Uh, you know, one lot could be th worth $13,000 of parts. Uh, so a lot of that is, okay, well, hey, I have a 45 minute queue here before the QC can get to my parts. That press is just sitting there for 45 minutes. And, and time is money. If that press isn't moving, no one's making money. Um, so that's been one of our, our, our next big pushes is really equipping the operators and upskilling them, okay, to, uh, so that again, the confidence is very high that when that, that part is submitted to QC, it's good. And that press can continue staying running that entire time. Where are you in that process? Uh, still in the research of, of equipment. Uh, so we haven't actually pulled the trigger and purchased, purchased the equipment yet. Uh, we're, we're still, um, you know, researching di different uh, machines, but uh, the, it is real in the, in the sense that we've already had a few machines brought in house to trial uh, on, for on the floor. And, and really that whole focus um, really to, to Paul's part has been, it's not the QC guys. I mean, they set up the program, but it's been all about Mr. Operator, come over here and run the machine. And I want to make sure you're comfortable uh, and that you feel confident and that you don't, you know, there isn't a barrier there for you because there's nothing worse uh, than the operator, you know, not confident and like, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and that's, like I said, been one of the, the largest improvements I've seen over the last six years is, man, this was so easy. Like I know I'm without doubt, that is the measurement. Um, and it doesn't take much skill uh, because it's being built off of luck. Luckily with today's uh, world where, you know, people are growing up on computers, a lot of it's based off of that. So, you know, if you, you have enough confidence to use Word and Excel or, or click on any icon on a desktop, a lot of times it's becoming that simple to use uh, this measurement equipment. Um, and it's been great. Yeah, and I think it's, it's as you say, Stephen, it's, it's about ownership of the process. The operator can own their bit of the process. They're not just there as a, a monkey pushing a button. They are responsible for it, which I think is is uh, is nice. But back to what you were saying about you know, you know the queuing up and you know how much measurements do you need? You know, we we see customers saying, oh well, you can scan it. Okay, so well, we want everything scanned then. It's like, well, why? You know that that's too much information. As you say, it's the critical points. You, just because you can take a lot of data doesn't mean you should take a lot of data. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, really a, it's really part of it to, to, to look at, you know, what are the critical points? You know, how do you make this more efficient? Because that's, that's what it is. It's about being efficient. You know, if you can, as you said, if you can measure two points and that will tell you if it's good or bad, you don't need to measure a thousand points to, to give you the same amount of information. And we, we come across that quite a lot where, you know, the customer says, oh, yeah, just you know, we want a complete scan of everything. It's like, well, is that going to give you really what you want? You know, it's a pretty picture, but ultimately it's not giving you the right information to make the decision. Um, and it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a battle between, you know, we can do it, but should we do it and, and, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's yeah, like, like the, uh, the comments. Yeah, that's the conversation around a lot of technology, I think, these days. In our industry 4.0 stuff, all the data you can collect, you know, should we collect it just because we can't collect it? That's good. Um, and, you know, you can bring in the technology to, to move quality to the shop floor. We talk about if you think there are any challenges with operators taking ownership of quality. I mean, is, is that easy? Is that is it a challenge for you to get the, the owners, to, to, to get them to take ownership? Um, you know, so surprisingly enough, uh, one of the things that we found is that was, you know, I was actually talking to one of our quality guys uh, before I, I flew out here. And, you know, one of the comments that he was making um, was when he originally took over the position, his whole thing was, no, I just want my operators to focus on, you know, pushing that button and measuring the parts. I don't want them to deal with any of the ADs, um, you know, the, 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 the quality issues or anything at the press, this, uh, or, or, you know, even, uh, you know, the efficiencies of the press, I'm, I'm going blank on, on the term. Um, OE. Yeah, yep, OE. No, I, I don't want them to be focused on any of that. And, you know, it created a lot of problems. And he actually found, you know what, let me actually start bringing these people in, when, uh, you know, and, and getting them involved in the OE and, and how they affect that OE directly. Um, and 
realistically, you know, right away, what was very interesting to him is that engagement kicked up instantly. Um, you know, these people became interested because now it, it got them, um, you know, involved uh, and, and they wanted to help. And that, it's, it's always the thing that you, you tend to find, right, is, is everybody assumes nobody wants to help. But tend, when you tend to get people involved, they want to get more involved. Um, and, and the one other thing that I, I definitely want to put out there is like the on-floor inspection um, aspect that we're talking about. It definitely there's a conflict of interest there. So our intent was never to have the operator qualify the part um, because obviously, you know, if it's a problem, problem die, I'm just going to accept everything <laughs> and, and mark it all good, you know, and there goes the product. Uh, so, it, you know, it still has to go into QC and we still rely on, on uh, the QC department to truly sign off on the part and qualify it and, and you know, generate the, the CFC uh, stating, you know, that the part meets all the specifications. Um, but the intent is to get the operator to, like I said, streamline that. So when it goes into QC, it's one shot, you know, or very little tweaking at that point because 99% of the part is good, if not 100% already. Um, and that was what it was more about. Um, so, yeah, so, but all said and done, no. I think to answer your, your base question, it tends to be the more that opportunities that we have given the operators on the floor to be a part of the process has only been a direct return on that investment. Um, and, and the other thing too, it's interesting is you tend to get more information out of them too. You know, that's the other aspect of it is, is the more you get them involved, it's amazing how much they know. You know, whereas if you don't ask the question, you never find out. All right. Anything else? Um, actually, I, I do have one question. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for this informative discussion. And I, I'm thinking of uh, maybe operations manufacturers without, you know, captive, you know, without their in-house robust design and build operations. They might have, you know, firefighting and tool maintenance, you know, that kind of die work going on inside. What, what can they hope to do to achieve some of these aims uh, that we talked about today when they, where, where they, they don't necessarily have their own internal access to, you know, the files and the quality and the build time and everything else. Um, because I know once you send things outside, you're introducing whole new levels of, uh, you know, whole new tumblers to the combination yeah. locks. So if you could talk about it, maybe, some of the things that uh, metal formers can do who don't have full in-house tool design and build operation. Well, the one thing I would say is uh, you want to make Jeff's job easier. <laughs> Oftentimes as stampers, we don't give our die shops enough information to do the job well enough for us. Uh, a lot of times stampers will rely on the die shop to, to do a lot of their engineering and figuring things out. Uh, they have no idea, or they don't have, they may have an idea, they don't have a clear understanding of all the idiosyncrasies that go on inside of our operations and what the process variables are. We have to define that uh, for them so that they can uh, design a tool uh, uh, appropriately. And uh, to just issue a purchase order with data and said, build, build a part to print, uh, that leaves a lot to desire. Uh, how would you comment on that, Jeff? Yeah, so we, we've had some customers that when we're in internal, like 50% and 100% design reviews, I mean, they will get some of their um, die repair, their, their tool and die makers involved in those design reviews so they can look at the intent of what that die is, how it's designed, what we have inserted where, versus just the tooling engineer looking at it because they're the ones that are gonna have to work on that tool every day in the press room. So we found when when we can have those people involved, it's a much easier transition when that tool ships from Walker to, to their place. So I think it's a lot of it is getting the right people involved early on in the process. And that's hard to do sometimes, but I think it pays big benefits in the end. I mean, I can comment a little bit too, because we, you know, interestingly enough, Weissog actually has a tool and die shop that, um, you know, we, we own as well that 
they do not actually manufacture parts, so that is changing. They're, they're, they're starting to get into manufacturing as well. And I think the reason being is because manufacturing can only help a tool and die shop. Uh, they go hand in hand. Um, and a prime example of some just, you know, some of the things that we've seen uh, over time, as Jeff had just mentioned, is, is the ability to work on a die in the press. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating. You know, and it's a lot of times it's just simple little things, uh, but just a quick example is uh, countersinking heads of the screws on a stripper plate only halfway uh, to the distance of the thickness of the head. Because, it, you know, though it looks a lot nicer when the head is fully counterboard into the stripper plate, there's nothing worse than trying to get that screw out of that stripper plate. Whereas if you at least leave half of it, you know, out of that stripper plate, you can get your fingers on it. Once you crack the thing loose, you can start unscrewing it and pop the stripper plates off in the press. Um, those are those manufacturing things that have nothing to do with the die build. Uh, so I think to answer your question, you know, part of it may be, you know, hopefully the tool and die shop that you're working with is somebody that you're continuously working with. And I think that's, that's the only way you're going to be successful, number one, because if every job you have is a different die shop, um, you know, I, I think you're not going to be that successful. So it has to be with building a relationship with that tool and die shop. And then almost building a book, a design guide of sorts to say, hey, here's all the things on that last, um, you know, die design that we saw that, you know, it just made our life frustrating of working on the die. Not so much about producing a good part or not. Uh, it's just the serviceability of it. Um, there's nothing worse than, you know, having, I, I can't uh, get to a punch, um, you know, because what, whatever, the way the, the keeper system was held in place, I have no choice but to pull this entire tool out of the press Oh, by the way, I need a crane to lift the thing off, um, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's an hour long situation just to get it out and get it back in the press again. I did nothing and I already lost all hour of my day. Uh, whereas if you can design things uh, where it's, it's serviceable uh, in the press, for instance, well, five minutes later, I'm up and running again, you know, a punch chip. Now I put a new a spare in there, you know, I knew what happened, blah, 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 um, and I'm up and running again. And I think that's the only way uh, to get that done and building a relationship with a tool and die shop and addressing those things as they come up and, and building that long-term uh, plan so that when that tool and die shop designs a tool, it's designed the way you like it. Kind of goes back to documenting what it is that you want yeah. and what works, right? <laughs> yeah, Jeff is nodding his head yes. I think he agrees with what you said. Um, we don't have any other questions from our attendees uh, online. So uh, I think we must have done a good job. You guys did a great job. Uh, Thanks for having us, Brad. So um, my prompter is dead. So I'm going to read, unfortunately, from my, <laughs> from my script. But I, I definitely want to thank everybody that participated for an excellent conversation. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Jeff and Paul online as well. Thanks for being here. Um, and of course, our attendees for attending uh, and participating. Uh, also, before we go, I want to acknowledge our production team for all the behind the scenes work that they've done to make the event so successful starts with our event coordinator, Allie Miller, and our marketing director, Drew Gutierrez, our videographer, Christian Paprika, and our director producer is always Randy Kish. So thanks for all your help behind the scenes. Uh, please join us next Tuesday, same time, two o'clock Eastern for our next Metal Forming Live session, which uh, will cover automation in the press room, a pretty hot topic these days. We're going to gear the conversation towards opti optimizing revenue per employee, which I know is of critical importance. And the guys at Westside will join us and uh, ask your questions online. Um, so if you're not registered for that one, you can go to our website, metalformingmagazine.com, and you can sign up uh, for next uh, Tuesday's event. So again, thank you for attending, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>